Welcome to main stage. Okay. Thank you. Right, well, um, I'm sorry for the slight delay. Presumably I'm on air now. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'll just start um, on the next slide. Um, the ro I'm talking about the role of climate change and biodiversity targets, particularly in the context of local authorities. So if I could have the next slide, please, the introduction, thank you. Well, we've heard today about national commitments and the diversity of the public sector sources and the important role that all government entities must play. Now, um, speaking for Baber and Mid Suffolk councils, we have set an ambitious goal ourselves of achieving a net zero by 2030. And we recognize that as local authorities, there are some areas where we can make a difference and some that are beyond our remit on our own. But also it's important to remember that as a local authority and as elected members, we act on behalf of the public. We're responsible for public money and we can only be successful with the public's permission. Have the next slide, please. So what did we do <clears throat> when we, um, what are we doing about this? Well, the joint councils have made declarations of emergency. Along with many other local authorities in Britain, we jointly declared both climate and biodiversity emergencies in 2019. And by making these public commits, commitments, the councils are demonstrating top-down support for the actions and changes that need to be made. It is important for us that we made these intentions public because that allows us to elevate the environment as a corporate priority and enable us to make the sort of policy changes that we need to be making. And these are fundamental changes to the way we will provide services and channel public funds if we are to achieve our goals. Now, we've also declared biodiversity emergency along with climate change. And this is because we believe that conserving biodiversity and habitats is of equivalent importance and is in any case linked to climate stability. And also people care about it. The interaction of climate change and habitat loss are the main causes of species decline. And while loss of a balanced ecosystem accelerates climate change, it also creates a feedback loop that makes the situation worse. Next slide, please. Key actions. Approach was plan first and then act. So the first thing we did was to set up a cross-party, cross-council task group, which met for both climate change and then biodiversity with roughly the same membership. We needed to see what we've got and established a carbon baseline. And to this end, we had an inventory which identified <clears throat> um, where our key priority areas are. We identified our key emitters, which the district council can control. And this is important because, as I said earlier, we can't control everything. Now, environment is now a key corporate priority. And as such, the administration can allocate officer time and most importantly, budget to climate and biodiversity projects. Both task groups recognize the important role of strategic planning in achieving success. We have the next slide, please. Our two largest emitters based on our inventory were waste collection and leisure center operations. And therefore this is where we are initially investing our resources. If you remember mentioning earlier the role of strategic planning, to take our actions forward, we anticipate preparing several supplementary planning documents to complement our joint local plan. And these will include, as well as the actions we're taking on the immediately at leisure centers and waste collection, they will include a raft of other measures that we can take. 
For the waste collection service, the first thing we looked at was to replace diesel with hydro-treated vegetable oil. And I believe a colleague is going to talk about that in more detail later. For leisure centers, there are several things we can do to reduce our carbon footprint, switching to low carbon tariff, solar panels, we're looking at ground source heat pumps and another array of micro technologies. For biodiversity, key approaches are partnership working and regular cabinet member meetings with other Suffolk local authorities on climate change. So collaboration for us was key. <clears throat> um, may I have the next slide, please? Now, in, in order to, to really make this a successful program, we believe that the real work starts, starts with the communities and individuals in our, in our area. Baber and Mid Suffolk councils cover a very rural area with parishes, towns, and um, villages. We have several hundred parishes in the combined districts. And these parishes we found are very keen and very motivated to participate in our climate change work. We have um, set up programs to outreach to parishes to give them guidance on how they can set up their own community projects to identify areas where they can plant trees and hedges and to encourage <clears throat> by offering advice and in some cases funding. The parish outreach program so far has been extremely successful and we've had a wide enough amount of interest. <clears throat> we've also involved other people and entities such as tree wardens, communities, farmers and interested individuals. May I have the next slide please? So just to wind up about um, <clears throat> Or the, really, it is a journey that we've started on. Our goals are ambitious, but we know that we cannot do it all at once. The journey, we recognise, is permanent. We have found working collaboratively with our partner organisations in Suffolk to be essential to our programme and to information sharing. And joint working can reap huge benefits in technology and funding. Responding to the emergencies applies new funding priorities for the councils, and this must be done in a fundamentally democratic way, that is, with the permission of the people. We have been fortunate in Baber and Mid-Suffolk to be able to actually allocate some of our budget to working on investing in climate change. We've also been very um, proactive in finding government funding sources, grants, um, there's an awful lot out there, but you do have to have some seed money to be able to access any of the grants that we've been able to use. We do need a clear national context, the context though, within which to act. And there are some fundamental changes that I would like to see government make to enable all of the different public sector entities to be successful in helping to achieve our 2050 um, national target. And in particular, I would like to see the government issue guidance on scope. I did mention that our inventory centred on scopes one and two emissions, that is the direct and transport related emissions that we can control. But being able to quantify scope three emissions, that is the indirect and um, <clears throat> in many cases, offshore emissions that we're responsible for is much more difficult, but also very important to achieving the wider global warming objectives. I would like to see a consistent approach to how we account for the shorter term global warming pollutants that often fall out of scope of the inventories that we, we prepare. And here I'm talking about things like carbon black, about water vapour emitted high in the atmosphere and about forest burning when the forests are not set to regrow themselves. I would like to see a consistent approach to monetizing natural capital and we are starting to think about how we can do that. So um, 
In conclusion, there's an awful lot to do. And I think one of the most important messages that we have learned is that small steps matter most. I'm not sure if there are any, is there any time for questions or how that might take place, but um, that, that's the conclusion of my presentation.